some days and uh, time within the year that you would feel yourself secluded you would feel yourself outcast and uh, during those moments during those time you could feel the very presence of God speaking to you and and telling you you know, comforting you, strengthening you, and when when um, when he was in his deep meditation, when Pastor Paul was in the, in deep meditation, that's why God inspired him and uh, give um, him that wisdom to to write that song. And um, those were the times when uh, we were young and uh, we were strong physically. Uh, and uh, those were the yesteryears of my life. And um, I need to tell you that uh, it's not as, as, as easy as you can feel and you can tell, you know, you can think how to live a life of Christianity because you don't know that our struggles is not because of what the things that we are not supposed to do and what the Word of God tells us what not to do. But it is the war behind us. I mean, the enemy that is confronting us time and time again and that wears you out. Although, as what Paul said, though my inward man, my outward man is decaying or perishing, but my inward man is renewed day by day Amen. and um, that's the only comfort only consolation I sympathize with his dad actually his dad is also a pastor and he is a son of a pastor and uh, God called him to be to be a pastor as well today's message is um, thank you Pastor Paul actually um, those songs were pretty much relevant to uh, our preaching this this morning and uh, we have learned about uh, brother Kiko would uh, show us later on the slide about the picture of the transformation or the process of change but before that uh, but the slide we have started the book of Ephesians uh, from chapter 1 we it all started from God and uh, um, having a relationship the the Holy Spirit to live within our lives and uh, allowing him to later on control our lives then eventually it will it will transform you and uh, that was the message I preached a couple of Sundays ago and um, here comes in chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians this is not only this, the presence of the Holy Spirit that would live within you, the power of the Holy Spirit that would transform you, and now you will see here, you will realize in, in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 10, but I'll be only um, focusing on verse 1 to 3, on now since you have allowed him to transform you, then the Holy Spirit or the presence of Jesus Christ in your life, you can find now the purpose why he made you, you. And uh, you are unique. You are one of a kind. You are different from all the people in the world. That's why you have a specific calling from God. So Christians do not mess up with your Christianity with your life because God has a beautiful plan for you as what he says in the book of Jeremiah 29 11 especially if you young people because the moment you drop the ball the last song that uh, Pastor Paul sang what was that I give my heart to you um, I was 16 when when I gave my all to the Lord and every day that's really true I gave my heart to him. Each moment, each time, 
you know, I think, I think about who am I, you know, what I have done. That's the moment also that I said, Lord, I'm nothing without you. And that's the time when I said, Lord, I can only exist because of you. And I can, and now because what you've done to me. So all I can do is I have nothing more to give you, but I have to give you all of me, not a part, but all of me. After allowing God to transform you, we need to find God's purpose in our lives. After allowing God to transform you, you need to find what purpose He wants you to have, what kind of life He wants you to live. Have you ever think about that, Christian? God has a purpose for our lives, even before we are born. In Psalm 139, verse 16, the Word of God says there that uh, even before we, this world was created, God had already planned His purpose. He already finished. Sometimes you say that, you know, God's work has, uh, was, was finished at the cross. You know, it's the work of redemption, but so far the work of his eternal plan, you know, from creation um, to redemption and even to uh, his coming again, um, even to what you are experiencing right now, what you are right now, physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, God knows it. And he has a purpose why those things are happening in your life. Now, the necessity or the importance of Jesus' resurrection is the only answer for your question why God needs to first transform you. Now, if God has not been raised from the dead, or if God or Jesus Christ did not die on the cross, and he just stayed, you know, there at the grave, and he did, was not raised from the dead. He, the transformation that he wants to happen in your life cannot be completed. Now, let me tell you this again. You, are, you will be struggling in your sins. Remember what Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15? If Christ was not raised from the dead, then you are still in your sin. And if Christ was not raised from the dead, this preaching is nothing. It's useless. It doesn't make sense. And we, you know, have become hopeless. Because Christ's resurrection, after he died, he rose again after three days. Then Paul said, if Christ did not raise from the dead, you are of all men most what? Miserable. That's why Christian life, it's only Satan that tells you that, you know, you're, you're down, you're discouraged, you're depressed. I heard a lot of people saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm so stressed out. Well, of course, I admit that I am sometimes stressed out physically, but not spiritually, and because my dependence, my trust is only on, on God and on His Word. Amen. That's the only comfort we can get, the promise. When all things and everything falls and fail, the only thing that we can hold on to and can trust on is the His Word, because His Word is eternal. His Word is powerful, and He will fulfill everything that He wrote in His Word. Hallelujah. God is not a liar. Satan is. It's Satan that tells you that, hey, you cannot make it for another day. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to commit suicide. I heard somebody the other day said that, you know, when, because I, I, I have... I have a diabetes, and uh, in case, you know, I, I have, um, um, my, my kidney will fail and I will have dialysis. I know a person, you know, that uh, 
after that he was told that he will start his dialysis, he got his gun and then shot his head and he died. You see that? That's how the world thinks when all things fail. Physical things fail. Financial things fail. Emotional things fail. They will take their lives. But for Christians, when everything fails, Jesus is still there. I like that, uh, that saying that, say, that they say, you know, um, for Christians, there's no crisis because Christ is the answer. The challenge here is, have you allowed God or Jesus Christ? And have you ever listened to the prompting or to the whisper of the Holy Spirit that is living inside of you to process the change that He wants to happen in your life? And if you do, then you can find His purpose. You will know the reason why you exist as a human being. You will know the reason why you are suffering right now. You, know, you will know the reason why you are in this kind of situation right now. I was in the same situation before and, and I have not, no one to run to, but the only person that I am gonna run to is no other than but God. And when I call his name, it's a beautiful name. A powerful name. That's why my favorite song is The Only Name. Because that's the only name that you can remember when everything else fails. Even your wife, even your brother, your sister, your mother, your father will forsake you. Anyone will forsake you, but Jesus will never, ever forsake you. Amen. Would you, should you? Allow him to start the process of change that he wants to happen. Of course, he has already transformed you, but he can only continually, you know, make the purpose in your life becomes clearer and becomes your future becomes brighter when you let him take over and do the process. A lot of Christians wear out themselves becoming Christian. Oh, it's so hard to be a Christian because it's hard to, you know, read the Bible. It's hard to, you know, it's, it's been a ritual for me going to youth hour, going to church, going to camps like this, like that. Of course, um, a lot of people, you know, at first they, 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 they love doing it. But later on, they would realize that uh, they said that it's, it's been my ritual. It's, it's just my, my tradition that... Year after year after year after year, this is what I'm doing. And for me, you know, well, for me, Christianity is just like Sunday. It's like an ordinary Sunday. For me, Christianity is just like, you know, going to church. Just Christianity is like doing this thing. But you know what? It's not that. You are just activity driven. A real Christian should be driven by the Holy Spirit, not by driven by the activity. Now, let me share you this uh, vi um, this clip. I mean, uh, this uh, slide, Brother, Brother Kiko would show it to us. We call it the cycle of a monarch butterfly. Okay, let's start, let's start from the real butterfly here. And uh, the butterfly, before that butterfly dies, uh, the, the, the another cycle is, this is the egg, and then the egg will turn to larva, and that larva would turn to pupa, and that pupa would turn again to butterfly. That means that there is a process. Now, what, the reason why I, I, I show that, uh, that picture is, our lives as Christians is in a process. Reason why sometimes we don't grow we cannot appreciate how beautiful living a christian life how to live a christian life you cannot appreciate that why because you are not allowing or you stop god to allow him to process the change that he wants to happen for your life 
But if you just allow him to let the change happen for your life, you know, he will make your life beautiful. I like even, you know, the Bible tells us that all things he makes it what? Beautiful. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you ever said to your life personally when you encounter problems, situations sometimes, even in school or even at work or even at, you know, a difficult traffic situation sometimes, did you say that God is good all the time and all the time God is good, but sometimes you keep on complaining? And if so, if you have started allowing God to start the process of change in your life, now, let me tell you this. You have engaged yourself into a smooth, a harmonious relationship between you and God. Oh, you like that? If you will just allow Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and His Word to just let Him take over and do the process of change that He wants to happen for your life. Have you ever asked God in your prayer like that one day? Did you say to the Lord, Lord, help me. You know, help me to change this attitude. Help me to change, you know, the kind of language that I'm using. Help me to change my, my attitude towards my, my teacher, or towards my parents, or towards my friend. And if so, you are now engaging into a smooth, harmonious relationship between you and God. Now, God wants to transform us so he can fulfill his purpose in our lives. So uh, there are things that I'd like to share with you this, 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 this morning. In Ephesians chapter 2, let's us uh, turn our Bibles in verse 1 to 3. I'd like to read it with you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Just follow with your eyes, it says, and you have made alive. Amen. And you, he made alive. Jesus made you alive again. Why? Because you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Now take note of the word course. The path. The way of the world. Jesus said, on the other hand, you remember he said, I am what? The way. Because the world has its own way. Their way of thinking. Their way, their way of living. Their, their way of life. But in Jesus, he has his own way. So should you allow your life to be in the way that Jesus wants you to be? And he says here, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of who works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Now, the first thing here is our predicament without Christ. What does it mean to say predicament? Predicament, I have checked it. It says that a troublesome or embarrassing, ludicrous situation. Or in short, it says a specific state of condition. This is your predicament before Christ and without Christ. What is our predicament? What is the specific situation that you are in right now? I don't want to, you know, uh, you, you know your heart. You know your life. You know the kind of sin that you do, right? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a judge to tell you that, hey, you know, this is what you're doing. You better repent of that sin. And then, because some people, when you confront of their sin, they would return, they would start pointing you to. They would say, hey, how about you? You have also sins, you see? And uh, you know, you, you know your, your, yourself. The reason why 
Uh, Paul was saying here, what is our predicament? What is the specific state of your condition right now before becoming a Christian or before having Christ? It's frightening, right? Isn't it? The pre-Christian predicament, as what Paul says here, he mentions it as, as your situation is dead. Okay, I'd like to illustrate this. If a dead person, what does it mean to be dead or spiritually dead? Okay, if, I'm, if I'm, I'm dead, if you have something against me, and then uh, I'll just wait, you know, I, I, I can't beat Pastor Sam, but when he dies, I'll start kicking him. So can I feel, you know, when you kick me, when I'm dead? Why? Because I'm dead. <laughs> I can feel anything. You see that? Now, let's shift this to this thing. If you are spiritually dead, even what God wants to happen in your life, because you are dead, God cannot do anything. But you know what? It's a sin that separates us and be, you become dead because of that sin. The reason why Jesus has to die on that cross, as Paul just mentioned to you that he finished it. He finished his redemption work, his redemptive work. The reason why he died, there's a song that says, the reason why he died is because for you to live. The only way for you to live is for him to die. You got the point there? You can never live because you're dead as what Paul says, because of our sin. The only way for us to become alive in God is for Jesus Christ to die for us. Wow. What an exchange. That's why we call it in our theology, substitute. The substitute, substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He replaced, instead of you, you know, will become forever dead or for, forever separated from God. You know, God, you know, in his own time, perfect time, Galatians 4.4, 4, sent his son into this world. And he made his son one of us, a human being. God cannot die. Why? Because he is God. He is powerful. The only way for him to die is when he becomes a human being. So God... It took God's power. You know, he, he left his splendor. He left his majesty just for, for the sake of you because of his love for you. Think about that. That's why you have no reason not to give back all, all of you to, to him because he gave his all for you. Now, as we go on with this, without Christ, now take note of this, we are spiritually dead and will not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. Now, it's clear at the book of 1 Corinthians 2.14. I wonder if Brother Akiko has a place it there. 1 Corinthians 2.14. But anyways, it says that a natural man does not receive the things that are of God. Natural man means, uh, in the original, it's, it's an unbeliever. For them, good, godly things is... Like when we were there in San Francisco, I, it was Dino that uh, hold that uh, poster, and then he's waving up in the air. Like there with Don and King and other young youth there, like Ashley, Nicole, and then somebody, you know, from the crowd, one of the youth, they started yelling. You know what they say? Jesus freaks. So uh, when you start displaying who you are into the world, you know, people that doesn't like your faith will not respond to the kind of faith you have. Why? Because they are spiritually dead. Spiritually dead person does not respond to God's spirit, does not respond to God's message. Because why? They are dead. They need the power of God to transform them. They need the, the power of the word to convict them. And when the time comes when they will be convicted, then they will start repenting, confessing their sin, and then they will 
ask Jesus to cleanse their hearts and cleanse their sins and allow the Holy Spirit to live in their lives. Now, the first thing here is, when we are spiritually dead, we got nothing from church services. Now, take note of that. We have no appetite for the Bible. This is the, the marks of spiritually dead person. We got nothing from Bible study. You would say, it's boring there, you know. I'd rather do some things that it would make me feel happy. I don't, I don't, I don't think that whenever the Word of God is, is preaching or the Word of God is teached and, and shared to, to the people, if it's shared, you cannot get something out from that. I have um, a pastor before that he is so busy from Monday through Saturday. He's an evangelist. Every night he goes house to house because that's his passion. He, he witnesses, he shares Jesus to everybody. Now during Sunday, he has no more time in studying. He will bring his big commentary and he will start reading the commentary and the Bible without even eye contact. And then he just look at his outline like that. And a lot of people, when uh, I look back, I'm, I'm, I'm 12 years old that time. And um, when I look back, some people are snoring. <laughs> A lot of people are sleeping. And uh, he doesn't care. He just keeps on sharing and preaching the word of God. But I said, one day, I said, I make a point that how can I get something from, from the word? I know that I can get something when the word of God is open and is preached. Even he doesn't, you know, expose it very good. He's not a good expositor. You know what I did? One Sunday, I started bringing a pen and a notebook. And each time he says the verse, I would write it. Start writing it. Sometimes he mentions 10 verses in the Bible. During the week, I would review all those verses. And by God's grace, those verses speaks to me. And there, I believe that the word of God that was preached is not useless. Because I believe that the word of God, you know, regardless of who the one or who are people, sometimes people are, are so picky, they would say, I will listen to Joel Austin, you know, he's a good uh, preacher. He, he makes people happy, you know, he doesn't make people sad. He doesn't convict people of their sin. I like this preacher because he's, he's so bombastic, you know what? But you know what, let me tell you this. Whenever the word of God is opened and is preached, you got to listen to it. Pay attention to it because the Bible tells us, Hebrews 4.12, that the word of God is quick and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, to the joints and marrows, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of our hearts. You are either, now listen to this, you are either spiritually dead or in a deep spiritual coma. If you don't respond to the preaching of the word of God, if you say, hey, Pastor Sam, when he preaches, it's boring. And if you don't respond, I don't want to be legalistic or, I mean, judgmental. But if you don't respond, even if I just, let's say, I, I, I read to you the word of God, as what uh, Pastor Paul was uh, quoting Psalm 100. If I just read to you Psalm 23 or I just read to you John 3.16, and if you don't get something out from that verse, you are either spiritually dead or in deep spiritual coma. Because not, not only spiritual person respond to the message of the word of God. If you are here this morning, and if you are a Christian, you are aware of that the Holy Spirit lives in your life. And if you respond to the, to the word of God, regardless of how that word of God is preached, you are alive and you are allowing Jesus Christ to transform or to make the process of change that he wants to happen for you. But if Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, you know, you, you go to all the activities of the church, you know all the verses in the Bible, but you don't apply them in your life, you are two things, either spiritually dead 
or in deep spiritual coma. Because I believe that the result of the Word of God in the, in the presence of Christ in the person's life is change. Remember what Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5.17, can you quote it with me? Therefore, if any man or anyone who is in Christ is a new creation, all things passed away and behold, all things are becoming new. There is always a change. You see that, that cycle of a butterfly? Yeah. So, there is always a change. There are three things in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 to 3, that describes our way of life before coming to Christ. Now, first, we follow the ways or course of this world. We follow the ways, the way or course. Other way is path. What is the way of this world? The way of this world is, we call it system. A way of thinking that is opposed to God, apart from Christ and close fellowship with Him. We are consciously or unconsciously controlled by the values of this world. That's why they called it a cosmos system. They called it a worldly system. Now, I'd like to give you an illustration of a TV. The television has such an impact on our culture. And why? According to a study conducted by a Florida State University Communications Professor, profanity, profanity during primetime television increased 58%. Now listen to this, between 1997 to 2001. That was 2001. What year are we now? We are in 2015. If you want to check that and Google that, www.fsu.com slash pages slash 2004 slash 11 slash 22 barry sapolsky dot html you have noticed language get worse each year right our kids are picking it up hollywood glamorizes filthy language vulgarity and sexual immorality this shouldn't appeal to us because of what truth in, in 1 John 2.15, you know what does it says there? Do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone love, loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. What is in the world? For all that, does, that are in the world are, are lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. All these things passes away, but, they, but, but those who do with the will of God abides forever. Without Christ, we follow the ways and the systems of this world. Second, not only the three things that we found here, a lifestyle or life before coming to Christ, that's what we call it, predicament. We follow the ways or course of this world. Number two, we follow the prince of the power of the air. Now, who is the prince of the power of the air? You know what? He is Satan. Pastor Paul said, Beelzebub. He is also called the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, as what it says in the Bible. If you are not obeying, you know, the rules and the authority that God has given, you know, in the church, God has given pastors, bishops, deacons, and, and, uh, and elders of the church, if you are rebelling against them, you are disobeying, actually, the body of Christ. Amen. And if you're disobeying the body of Christ, you are in the spirit of this world. Amen. Therefore, when you're in the spirit of this world, you are, your boss is not Jesus, your boss is Satan. Now, Jesus called him the prince of this world. Why? He takes advantage of and dominates those who are spiritually dead and weak. Now, the warning is found in 1 Peter 5, 8. It says, be sober. Be vigilant or be watchful for your adversary, your enemy, the devil. Is, he prowls like a roaring lion. You know, one thing I like when, when, when one of these Christians told me one day, you know, Satan, he cannot bite you. And you know why? He said, I asked him why. Because he only roars like, he said, like that. 
But he will not bite you. Why? Because you have the blood of Jesus. Amen? When he bites you, he will be, he, he, he will die. Why? Because you have the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ cleansed you with his precious blood. That's why he hates the blood of Jesus. <laughs> he only, he only prowls. Now look at this. Devil wants to ruin your finances. Number two, he wants to destroy your marriage. Number three, he wants to wreck your home. He wants also to wreck the church of God. Amen. He wants to get young people involved in alcohol, in drugs, in premarital sex, in other things. Satan can hurt, he cannot hurt God directly. Now listen to this. Satan cannot hurt God directly, so he does it indirectly by hurting God and destroying, he destroys the people that God loves. The only way for him to hurt God is to destroy the people that God loves, and that is you and I. And finally, we live gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Chapter 2, verse 3, A and B. This sinful nature wants to be gratified. What means, what is the word gratification means? You understand that, you know, to give pleasure. So without Christ, we gave in to its de desires and thoughts. No, you know what a predicament. Without Christ, we are controlled by the unholy trinity. I call it unholy trinity because there are three things. Number one, unholy trinity is the world, this world that we live in. You mean, hey, pastor, this world is wicked? It is. Peter says that this wicked and perverse generation. Why perverse? Because they twist the truth to error. They substitute truth to lie. Instead of lie, sometimes you believe on, on a lie you, rather than believing on the truth. The unholy trinity is the world, the flesh, that is your nature, my nature. You have it. That is, you wage war each time, every time, all the time, and the devil. So we have three known enemies. We call it the unholy trinity of Satan. That is his kingdom. His kingdom is this world. His kingdom is your flesh, your nature. And his kingdom is, he is, he rules, he is called Lucifer because he is the leader of that force. Not God's force, but world's force or satanic's force. Now, we cannot be positive about the ways of the world, the flesh and the devil, and still be holy, just God. Now, let me repeat this one again, and as I close. We cannot be passive about the ways of the world, the flesh and the devil, and still be holy. There are Christians that live a compromised life, right? You need to choose between the two. It's either flesh or spirit. Just choose one. You cannot say, hey, on Monday, because I'm, I'm, I'm a human being, I can compromise, you know, I can sin. I hate those people that say that for Christian, we are not, we, we are not totally uh, righteous, but because we sin less. I, that's not the right word. You, you, you allow the thoughts and system of the world to control your mind. In God's word, it's only, as what Jesus said, it's only you cannot serve two masters. It's only worldly or godly. It's only God or Satan. You cannot mix God and Satan. Can you allow Jesus and Satan to, they, they call themselves, if, if you want to be friend with Satan, to be friend with Jesus, and if you're a Christian, you are friend of Satan and friend of Jesus, then you make Jesus and Satan becomes pare or buddy. Can you allow Jesus to, or Satan will call Jesus, hey, buddy? And then Jesus would say, why, why did you say, why did you call me buddy? Because he said, hey, because one of your, you know, there's one of your leaders there in, in the LBFC. 
that you know he compromised his faith. Sometimes he he follows me. Sometimes he follows you. That's why I called you buddy. See that? That's why Jesus said he warns in Revelation. No, take note of this. You are not cold. You are not hot. You are lukewarm. It's either a Christian should be cold, spiritually dead, or should be hot. Because if you are lukewarm, what does he say to John? I will vomit you. I will spit you out of my mouth. So you better make up your mind, Christian. You know, Christianity is, is not just, you know, you say, hey, it's okay to be a godly on Sunday and worldly on Monday. Uh, we call it, you know, in our term, Jusko uh, Jusko is, he said, God, my God, my God. Jusko oh, Jusko, that's in our own term in, Filip in, in Tagalog or in Filipino. And because the Sakaran is here. But in... But from Monday to Saturday, he called Disco Disco. <laughs> there are Christians, I know that they hang their Christianity on Mondays. It's true, you know, let me close this, uh, um, this, this, this sermon. Charles Spurgeon one day was preaching and uh, uh, Charles Wesley, uh, he's also an evangelist. And, and they, they, they have a, a different kind of, you know, uh, in their theology, one time the other theologian accused him. He says, "Don't you know that you know um, you have a deacon?" Yes. And then he said, "You know that your deacon is a demon." I said, "What? He is a deacon on Sunday. He is a demon on Monday." You see that? So what's out, Christian, especially you young people, you are in a hard, hard situation. Way back in our time in the 80s, you know, we've been struggling a lot in our youthful age. Much more now in, the, in 2015. Now, you cannot hang your Christianity on your closet on Mondays. They said that a happy Sunday makes a holy Sunday creates a happy Monday. So this should be a continuity. Authentic Christians are people who prove the evidence of a right relationship to God by the good things they do as well as by the bad things that they do not do. Let me repeat it as, as I close. Authentic real Christians are people who are who proves themselves that their right relationship to God by doing good things as well as by not doing bad things. <laughs>